Moses sees a bush on fire and it's not being consumed. It just keeps burning and burning and burning and glowing and glowing and glowing. He said, I have to check this out. And he goes there and the closer he gets, he finally hears the voice of God. And that's the way the fire of God works. It gives light, it gives warmth. It does not consume. And it challenges the one who sees that light and experiences that warmth to do something, to set the world free. And Moses receives his commission to go down to Egypt and take the slaves there and under the name of God deliver them to freedom. Now, all of us who have experienced the fire of the Holy Spirit in the sacraments in confirmation, we're supposed to be that type of light and warmth for the world to deliver the world from slavery and to be delivered from slavery ourselves. Now, slavery is alive and well today and takes on many and multiple forms. Perhaps the most heinous is the slavery of uh, uh, prostitution and the international sex trade, a horrible, terrible uh, reality that needs the light of God cast upon it to set children and exploited people free. Then there's the slavery of child labor, where children work long hours, not having time for an education, not having time for play, but just have to exist, enriching others while staying impoverished themselves. Then there is a virtual slavery of people who work long hours for subsistence wages. I was reading about three years ago in the Smithsonian Magazine, a feature article on China, and the writer went to a factory owner the factory owner said, I'm so lucky. I have the best workers in the entire world. And they were producing sandals to be exploit, exported and exploited to Eastern Europe. He said, my workers work from 8 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. 15-hour workday. Isn't that special? Well, I'd say those are good workers, all right. And they were paid between $280 and $400 a year. Now, sometimes you hear people talking about fair trade, free trade, etc. You'll never compete against virtual slave trade. <laughs> Those sandals going to Eastern Europe were even undercutting Eastern European wages. And this shows how slavery anywhere in the world impacts us. I suppose if I went to my closet and started looking at the clothing in my uh, closets hanging there or in my drawers, probably 80% of it is made in China under who knows what type of conditions. Who knows? In that same magazine, they had a big picture of a textile factory, and it looked pretty good to me. It was a large, spacious, well-lit area with huge windows and maybe a couple hundred windmen at sewing machines, sort of evenly spaced. And I showed it to my sister, and she picked up something immediately that I missed. She said, oh, look, they're all working in their overcoats. There was no heating in the factory. Well, that's one way to cut down on your, your uh, operational cost. So slavery and injustice anywhere in the world impacts us in the here and now and explains why we struggle to have any type of industrial base. Slavery and sin is always social and impacts the whole world. And then there's the slavery which is very common in every corner of the world, in every culture, that comes from drugs, alcohol, and promiscuity, and destroys the individual human soul and weakens the soul of any nature, of any nation, any culture, as well as the individual. 
and it needs the light and warmth of God to be shined on it so that people could put themselves under the power of God, enter a 12-step program, and be delivered from that terrible slavery. Something that, it, that offers pleasure and fulfillment and really brings and delivers a hell on earth for the individual, their families, and the society and culture around them. Now, our culture, which has freedom as one of its great cornerstones that we could be so proud of, also allows people, if they so choose, to abuse that freedom and to embrace a personal slavery which is terribly destructive. And sometimes that's rewarded in many ways, especially in our pop culture. The latest really uh, top pop singer is Lady Gaga. And I've been following her career on the internet and reading little articles about her in Rolling Stone on the internet where I could read it for free. <laughs> and she is certainly a phenomenon. She has a Catholic background. To her credit, she went to a very good Catholic high school taught by nuns, and they're always trying to provoke her to say something against the nuns, and she always says, no, they gave me a great education. I got a good foundation in art and the cultures, etc. cetera. Uh, spiritually, maybe not so much. <laughs> after she got out of high school, dropped out of college after a year, uh, she went around the New York club scenes, became noted as a exhibitionist, somebody who used drugs and alcohol, somebody who was pro promiscuous, but had good talent singing and musically, and was a genius at, at taking her talents and selling them to the public, a great self-promoter. So she is a super hit with her sort of techno dance music. And her latest hit song and video is Bad Romance, it's called. And uh, the refrain line goes something like, Rama, Rama, Roma, Roma, Gaga, Gaga, Ooh, La, La, La. <laughs> Hope I didn't offend anybody with that. <laughs> but once you've heard it, it sort of sticks in your brain. <laughs> and it's called Bad Romance. It's a catchy tune. She's a good dancer. She's noted for outlandish costuming, or no costuming at all sometimes. <laughs> And uh, the song is aptly titled Bad Romance because in the central theme is, I don't want to be your friend, I just want to be your lover. Well, that makes for a bad romance with a bad ending for sure. And other elements in there that says, I want your revenge or I want this or that, which are all degrading tendencies and self-destructive tendencies. In the midst of all every dancing, I did see she quickly threw in one sign of the cross. <laughs> well, there's only so many ways the body can move. But at the end of the video, I think it gives the game away where she realizes the course she's on. She shows herself as a burnt out robot on a bed with, next to a burnt out skeleton. And that's the ultimate ending for people who follow a path of promiscuity, drugs, alcohol, and the accumulation of wealth. When the arts are put at the service of God, you have a Bach, you have a Schubert, you have a Michelangelo. When the arts become a religion unto themselves, you have, well, Lady Gaga <laughs> in her present form. Now, we in the Society of St. Paul, part of our task is to pray for the artists, the singers, the musicians, those that work in media. Pray that they use their God-given talents in a godly way. Now, her life and career isn't over yet, although pop stars come and go pretty quickly. But I pray that she'll rethink the value she got in her Catholic school and say, just maybe, I could use my talents in a different way, not only for myself, but for all of my fans who will be influenced by my look, by my behavior, etc. 
Now, if this seems like an outlandish way to treat a reading of Moses' conversion, let's look at St. Paul in today's second reading, where he takes the same story of Moses and he applied it to the Christian community of Corinth where he was preaching and having a certain amount of success. He said, when the people went through the Dead Sea, they were baptized in the Moses. When they went through the cloud, they were baptized in the Moses. And when they walked through the desert, they received the food of God, just like we are receiving the food of God in our own Eucharist. But along the way, many of them grumbled and many of them lost their way because of their bitterness, their lack of faith. And he applied that to the Corinthian community. He said, so even if we have the grace of our faith, let's not be overconfident. We could fail along the way and fall ourselves. So the temptation of any believing community at any time is to look at uh, the so-called sinful community and say, oh, we're better than them. <laughs> and as soon as we say that, we usually fall flat on our face ourselves. And so we say, if we are better than someone else, it's only and totally and completely by the grace of God, which has an enormous patience, which brings us to the gospel passage today. The owner of a vineyard comes, the owner of a garden comes, he sees a useless fig tree, says, cut it down. But the gardener says, no, no, let's give it one more year. Let me hoe around it and fertilize it and see what marvelous, tasty fruit could be produced next year. But if nothing happens even then, then we can chop it down and get rid of it. Well, the Lord has been hoeing around our lives from the time we're very young to when we're not so young and really hitting us with a lot of fertilizer <laughs> that many times we don't want. But that fertilizer is meant to challenge us to be fruitful in our lives and in our loves. Now, when Moses went to the slaves of Egypt, they wanted to know God's name and they gave it to them. I am, I'm the one that's always been with you in your suffering and I always will be there. When we bring our lives and our message to an enslaved world, and they ask us what God's name is, we can take it right from the letter of St. John and say, God is love. And it's that love that I'm bringing to you because of that great gardener, Jesus Christ, who is hoeing around in your life fertilizing it so that you too could have a fruitful existence.